Um, but what is crypto finance? This world, this, this, this uh, world is now about $300 billion um, of assets. You can see from the graph that we were at $800 billion in January. Um, and I think of crypto finance as two areas, the initial coin offerings I'm going to talk about a bit, and I'm going to talk about crypto exchanges and how it tucks into the public policy. So we're running about three to 500 initial coin offerings around the globe a month right now. So what is an initial coin offering? And I speak to you as somebody that was at Goldman Sachs for 18 years and then was in the public sector, but in terms of what, what is this economics really? Well, so purchasers do anticipate profits through appreciation. That is the equilibrium. This is not selling laundromat tokens. And you all who are entrepreneurs in the room are really trying to get investors interested because you're saying, I can build this network, usually based on a white paper. And you, of course, have not yet produced the network. Basically, you've heard this debate around the globe. Is it an investment token or a utility token? And I think that's a completely false distinction. Something can be both. It's a false distinction of convenience. I'm saying people of good faith don't want to be regulated. I understand that. But the overall capital markets, and as a public policy guy, I sort of say the overall capital markets benefit by some investor protection. And so a utility token that does not have any dividend, does not have any shareholder rights, still can be an investment scheme or an investment contract that investors could benefit from some additional protections. What are crypto exchanges? The first bullet point I want to focus on for a second, they really are a bit different than traditional exchanges because they act as matching agents, bringing buyers and sellers together, but they also act sometimes as counterparties where they're actually standing on the other side of their customers. And thirdly, they're custodians. And this is the biggest difference from traditional exchanges. So what's happened is about 95 to 98% of all the transactions on any, any given day in a particular blockchain, Bitcoin I'm thinking of, are actually not on the blockchain. They're on ledgers held at the various crypto exchanges. But what we've done is we've sort of transferred cent centralized bank custody to crypto exchange custody. And guess what? The crypto exchanges you know less about. So what's happening in crypto trading that I think is also interesting is they're moving countries. This Morgan Stanley created this chart. I think I love this chart. <laughs> They're moving to light regulatory locations. Now, it's hard to read, but Malta is all the way to the left. Belize, Seychelles, I mean, these are, these are the epicenters of capital markets, Malta, Belize, and Seychelles. Uh, you know, something looks a little odd about this chart. I'm sorry, it's just me. But the Maltese prime minister has said that he wants to be the center of the crypto world. I mean, he. They're usually very low population countries that are also sometimes known as tax havens, not always. I'm surprised we don't see the Cayman Islands on here. And some of the, the uh, uh, this is by trading volume. Some are moving because they think, all right, I can move out of Hong Kong that's cracked down or Japan that's cracked down or South Korea that's cracked down. So they're moving to find lighter regulation. Not, I don't think it's sustainable, but it's happening. The main thing any entrepreneur in the room should think is, am I, is somebody giving me money in the hope that it appreciates? And is that appreciation basically based on my team's effort? And if you're receiving money from somebody and they think and hope to get an appreciation based on your efforts, bingo, you're a security under US law. So that's why I say the duck test. If it waddles like a duck, it quacks like a duck, it's a security. I think some countries will ultimately update their laws to covering crypto finance. You don't see a lot of that yet. But over the next three to five years, I think you will see some countries updating. If a $300 billion market became $3 trillion or $10 trillion or something, I think they would promote more investor protection. 
But in some jurisdictions, it might be updating laws like we did in Wyoming and Arizona that rolls back a little, creates what's called sandboxes or regulatory safe harbors. So my conclusions, I think that blockchain can be a catalyst for change. I think it truly can be transformative in finance in particular. That doesn't mean we're going to lose central banks or commercial banks. I think commercial banks and central banks will be here for decades. But I think that these could be catalysts for change. Our payment systems could be much faster, much more economical. We could have more inclusion in our payment systems. I think finance itself can be better uh, run and more efficient. And that some of the startups will beat the incumbents. Investor protection, I believe, is really why so many of the Western economies grew so much from the 1930s on, and then in the last 20 to 30 years, so many of the uh, Asian and, 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 uh, and Latin American countries have joined in, have joined in partly on the backs of investor protection because it, it frankly, it ultimately lowers cost for issuers if investors trust the market and come into the market. Uh, thank you. That was probably, to my view, Probably the greatest presentation I saw. Uh, touching... Did you say this was the greatest presentation? Yeah, touching the yes, yes, on summarizing issues on bridging blockchain with uh, traditional economy.